the Last Punch Podcast with the Queen and the Rat. Oh, yeah. Hi there, folks, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Last Punch Podcast with the Queen and the Rat. I am your host, the Queen, also known as Abby, and with me is my co-host... I am the Rat. I am a amateur jiu-jitsu practitioner and overall gamer. There we go. I, uh have a karate background myself. I'm also a streamer. Uh, other than that, I don't think there's anything else to say about us, really. <laughs> We're not really that interesting. No, not, not really. But uh, yeah, let's get straight into it, I think. So UFC 241 just wrapped up uh, last night. A lot of, a lot of different stuff to talk about. Um, I guess we start with the kind of the cat in the bag thing which is Costa Romero um I'll let you give your thoughts first Rat well uh, Romero didn't seem to fight quite as aggressively as he normally would he seemed to he had his back against the cage a lot of the time compared that to the Romero we've seen before where he likes to explode and really push you up against the cage yeah definitely I, I can see that maybe it's the money Maybe he just doesn't feel the need to fight anymore. <laughs> Could be. Costa's performance, on the other hand, though. I mean, not much to say bad about that. Maybe his gas tank could be improved a little bit. Maybe slightly. But other than that, I mean, what a show. What a show from both gentlemen, really. They uh... well, the, thing, the thing about Costa's gas tank was both of them were getting wobbled hard constantly. That takes a lot out of you. Yeah, that's very true. And they both got dropped in the first round within like what a minute of the fight was it? Yeah, two they minutes didn't waste max. Time at all. <laughs> that was ridiculous. So, but the fight as a whole was ridiculous. I mean, so many, so many um, classic moments from that fight that I think are going to live down in years to come. I think, in particular, the the image of the both of them holding hands behind their backs as they stare at one another. I, th I think that's going to be an image to to burn into your brain. I think we're going to see one, that a lot over the years. One thing that surprised me is that Romero didn't wrestle more. He successfully got a takedown, I believe, at the end of the second, but he didn't really initiate much wrestling after that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, maybe he felt the strength of Costa on the ground, because Costa got up pretty freaking quickly. It could be that he kind of felt it was a wasted effort. Mm. I don't know. Especially because Romero is such an explosive wrestler. He's not really the kind of guy who will lean on you for a long time. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe the fact that it didn't it didn't really get him anywhere kind of put him off wanting to wanting to you know explode again. Because of course you also always got to think about that gas tank. <laughs> I mean that man's notorious for having probably the smallest gas tank of any fighter. Even compared to heavyweight, heavyweights, which is kind of shocking. <laughs> Maybe if he moves up to 205, it will actually improve it because he won't be dehydrated. He really struggles with that weight cut. Yeah, he does. He does. Overall, though, an Im a hugely, hugely impressive performance from both of them. And uh, the facial expressions that both gentlemen kept giving as well was, <laughs> was definitely meme-worthy. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of gifts of uh, of Yoa Romero's panted dog face that he kept giving. <laughs> I feel like he was trying to provoke Costa to throw more. Yeah, probably. I mean, I I also I I watched a few like slow mo clips of when he was getting punched and he would open his jaw really, really, really like wide and sort of. As if he wants to eat the punch kind of thing. And I, it got me thinking, is that some really kind of weird outlandish attempt at absorbing the strikes? Like, does Yoel, well, is Yoel thinking that maybe if you loosen your jaw and keep it wide as you get hit, you kind of, you run less chance of a, a broken jaw and the impact kind of, does less damage as a result and it doesn't hurt you so much i don't know from what i've seen it's the opposite when you have an, an open mouth it tends to make the jaw 
like snap back more and it's that snap motion that shuts the brain off yeah that's very true very true maybe not then <laughs> maybe i'm reading too much into it giving him a little too much credit maybe he was i think it was thing. more just mental warfare yeah as well as possible just trying to catch his breath like really inhale as much as he can yeah could have been yeah i mean uh, let, let's face it yoel is known for doing for lack of a better Weird term, strange things. things in the octagon. <laughs> the uh, the rock hold kiss comes to mind. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's Cuba. That's standard. <laughs> I uh, I I think we should maybe cover the Pettis and Diaz fight now, cause, cause wow, I mean, to go to go from what what is arguably one of the best fights of the year straight into one of the best performances of the year from a guy that's had a three-year layoff and the guy that like kind of got beat up a fair bit in the first round and then proceeded to just i don't know just take over i mean yeah your thoughts because i was i was astounded i think diaz has probably worked on primarily his wrestling and his ability to check kicks because his ability to check kicks was very, oh, yeah. very impressive in this fight. <laughs> Normally oh, he, yeah. he gets chewed up with those leg kicks, but he did really well defending them. Yeah. I mean, the fact that uh, he managed to not only check the kick from Pettis, and I think it was I think it was towards the end of round two, but he managed to drop Pettis with it because Pettis, um, you know, smacked his ankle off of the shin and kind of messed it up a little bit. I mean... Just goes to show, as you say, the, the the huge improvement he's made. You could hear the sound when uh, Pettis threw that kick to it. was a horrible, like, high-pitched clack sound. It was, ugh. Yeah, it was. It was. And the knees as well. Just thinking of thinking of sound and, and impact. The, uh, the knees that Diaz was given uh, on Pettis' head in, like, I think it was round three. That was super, uh -huh. super impressive. I think Diaz has probably taken like, really extreme Muay Thai lessons during his break because the knees were impressive, the ability to check kicks were impressive. Didn't Diaz throw a few kicks of his own too? I think he did. I think he threw a couple of kicks to the body as well. So I think he's really trained properly in Muay Thai for a while. To be honest, I think he's trained in everything. I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, you, you can obviously speak on it more, in fact, being the jiu-jitsu practitioner of us but i felt the the jiu-jitsu that he showed in that uh, match was really really good the way he was able to reverse positions a lot the way he kept um he kept pettis from advancing when pettis did have the better position so when he was in full guard for instance every time he would like shuffle up to to kind of get into a mount position of any kind uh diaz would immediately like do this kind of butt scoop thing with his hips and just push Pettis right back down the body and all the way down so that he had to slowly make the climb again. And I, I've, I don't think I've ever seen somebody do that before in the octagon. Or if I have, it's maybe, you know, once or twice. It's, uh, yeah, I was just overall hugely impressed. And, and the reversals, as I say. That sort of technique isn't a, a particularly advanced thing to do. Yeah. I think Diaz has simply just refined the fundamentals a lot more during his layoff yeah. uh, for example we were talking about the uh, during the, the fight we talked about the omoplata that he attempted on Anthony Pettis he used that more as a sweep you know, it, it was less of threatening a submission and more a way to get back into an advantageous position and that really is just textbook Gracie Jiu Jitsu right there threatening a submission to obtain an advantageous position we do that constantly yeah definitely yeah, I, I, yeah, <laughs> very, very good call out there to, uh, to harken back to the, to the Gracie family, because I agree with you, it, it, very, very, very Gracie-like. Well, As you Diaz said, I think... A, a, a direct, um, he's directly taught by Carlos Gracie. He is, yeah, and he has a Cron Gracie in his corner as well. So, it makes sense that all of those Gracie fundamentals would be in his game. Yeah, it does. And, um... Another thing that I think it kind of pr that this performance proves is that sometimes a layoff 
isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know how people always talk about, like, ring rust and the longer you stay out into the octagon, the worse it is? Well, clearly not always, because in the three years that he's been gone, as you say, he has so obviously refined every one of his skills. His boxing, his Muay Thai, his Jiu Jitsu. He's just gone to town on it. And he, I mean, he said in interviews that he, uh, he'd never stopped training throughout the whole three years. He kept ready for fights. Just nothing came. Nobody ever called him out. There was nobody that really interested him. So he never called anyone out himself. And yeah, it's, it's clear to me that, that ring rust is not always uh, necessarily a thing. Like, say what you want about the Diaz brothers, but from how they improve during breaks like that, we've seen it in both brothers, really. They clearly have fantastic work ethic. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, we know that, don't we? Uh, if you go back to, like, the old sort of embeddeds that they used to do um, before it came a bit more sort of fight week focused, when it was a bit more about kind of the lives and stuff of the fighters and whatnot... We saw that they take like constant uh, triathlons and marathons and whatnot. Uh, Nick's always entering competitions and whatnot, and so's Nate. And yeah, they definitely keep themselves healthy. It's a it's a big part of their their lifestyle. Not just health, but like just overall training, working on boxing, working on for kickboxing, working on just every single aspect of the game that they do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, his boxing looked as crisp as anything. I, I, I to be honest, I, I struggle to find any faults in Diaz's performance other than the, the, the faults that he himself has admitted to, which is that he gassed out in that first round because he kind of, because it was a three round fight instead of a five round fight. He said he felt more of an urgency to get it done quicker. So he kind of expelled a lot of his gas tank in that first round. And he feels that if he had another three-round fight, he would be more, you know, he would balance himself better through the three rounds. But then again, he's also said he doesn't ever want to do a three-round fight again. So <laughs> That can be that. attributed to Ring Rust, actually, because they just forget the pacing that they used to hold back when they were doing their fights. That's true, yeah. But, I mean, I mean I'm inclined to believe in myself. I think, I think it makes a lot of sense that, because he's had... I think the last two, if not three, fights of his were five rounders. He's gotten used to it, and so dropping down to that to that shorter time would kind of make you worry a little, make you think, "Oh God, I've got okay, I've got to work faster here. I've got to get this guy out quicker than in a five rounder. I can't like drag him out so much." Who knows though? Yeah, and looking at the way that the welterweight division is shaping up right now. I would say a good fight to make for Nate Diaz now would be a rematch with Rafael Dos Anjos. That's true. That would be good. Rafael Dos Anjos. RDA's coming off a loss, isn't he? Whereas... And uh, Pettis was ranked lower than Rafael Dos Anjos, even now. True, true, but he was coming off a win. It's tough to match up a guy coming off a win to a guy coming off a loss, especially in such a stacked division. And Diaz has kind of just thrown his hat straight into the middle of it. Um, yeah. It's tough. I would Plus say he that called Diaz out Masvidal. He called out Masvidal at the end of the fight. And Masvidal has uh, verbally agreed and said, hell yeah, I'm up for that. So if the UFC brats are up for it, that's m most definitely the fight we'll see. And probably around maybe November time. True, but I would really like to see a rematch between Javier Dos Anjos and Nate Diaz, especially once we've, since we've seen Nate Diaz so highly improved. It would be a good fight for sure. I mean, there's many, many, many fights to make up in that world away division right now. Like, too many. In fact, seeing as there's so many, why don't we throw it out to the audience? How's about you guys... Email us. I'll uh, I'll let you guys know what the email is at the end of the podcast, and you guys can uh, can let us know what you think of the welterweight division right now. And now that Diaz is kind of shaking it all up even further than Masvidal had already done, um, yeah. What do you think's gonna happen next? What's your what's your dream matchups 
for the currently chaotic uh, welterweight division. Kind of a throw out to, to Colby there as well. Considering he's just messed it all up. <laughs> who isn't, God, who isn't messing Colby. up those rankings at the welterweight division right now? It's crazy. Anyway. Yeah, like all, the, all the people who used to be on top are just tumbling down now. Exactly, yeah. And those that were having meteoric rises are, are teeping off as well. Well, Darren Till in particular, shall I say. <laughs> oh, that poor taxi driver. <laughs> so, I guess we should move on to the main event. Uh, Cormier Miocic, I mean, wow. <laughs> Just freaking wow. Um, I guess we'll move through round by round for this one, seeing as it's the main event, it's kind of the, the focus of the card. Um, round one, what a round for Daniel Cormier. I mean, yeah. just what a round. The way he lifted up Miocic, held him in the air for what, five, six seconds straight, just, just stood there with this 230 odd pound man on his shoulders like it was nothing. And then he just drops him on his, on his like, head slash back slash neck just just everywhere drops him everywhere all in one go super impressive and then he proceeds to like just yeah just dominate on that, the ground. Like, he, he secured control on the ground he it wasn't just a slam and then like was control he he controlled him no it it was uh it was typical cormier style yeah it was one of those it was the the, the typical slam that we've seen him give to almost every opponent he's ever had opportunity to slam he did it to yeah. Jones, he did it to Gustafsson, Anthony Johnson. It, the it's, list goes on and on. It's what he does. He's such an expert at that high crotch throw. He is, yeah. And I think due to him being so short as well, that's what gives him the ability to lift these bigger, heavier, well, not necessarily heavier, but certainly bigger gentlemen up and, and sort of hold them up like a trophy on his shoulder before dropping that's, them down. That's a point where... The people who he's done it to, Gustafson and, and Stipe especially, they're tall, tall guys. And exactly. very heavy. Yeah. And when someone's taller than you, it's actually a lot more difficult to lift them because they can lift you simply by straightening out their back and standing up straight. Meanwhile, with you, it's a lot more difficult to get that lift because unless, you're not using your body mechanics. Unless you scoop them like Cormier does. Cor yeah, Cormier doesn't. If if you watch him, he doesn't lift from like the the waist kind of thing like most people would do. He goes under the butt, and he lifts them from their the like the the top of their thighs, the bottom of their butt, upwards onto his shoulder, and then drops them. So it, yeah, it allows he, the short guy to get a much better kind of grip on the taller guy as a result. I mean, it's a genius way of doing it. It's the best way to make use of your height because if you're taller, you can easily body lock someone from the upper body and stand up straight to lift them. Exactly. But if you're shorter, you're going to have to go lower down in order to make the, the actual act of standing up straight actually lift them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Plus, going right under the butt kind of gives you that, it gives you that little bit of a, a kind of a, a barrier to lift off of, you know? Also means that they can't force their hips out to escape the throw. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Once once you got them up on the shoulder, you're they're up there. You're you're just you're walking with them, <laughs> just like he did. I mean, yeah, but an, an incredible round. The only thing I would say that was maybe a damper on that round was he really should have finished Miocic when he, he had the chance. He very well could have. He chose to spare him, which was just. Well, the, the issue was, looking back on it, the, the issue was uh, the ref, Herb Dean, shouted something. I think he shouted something about fingers in the cage or something to that effect about Miocic's that, hand. That's and, when Stipe was scooting out to the side. I think that Herb Dean was ready to stop the fight. I, I, he I he looked he ready. He it. did. He did look ready. And the, the problem was, as he shouted, Cormier looked up. Because I think maybe he wasn't, you know, quite sure what had been said. So he was wondering whether that was a verbal stop the fight kind of thing. So he looks up and as he looks up, he stops striking. And Miocic almost immediately takes the opportunity to turn over. 
and that's when the position changes and he can no longer hammer fist. I, I thought it was Cormier that moved position. I think Cormier kind of lifted his leg a little bit as Miocic turned, but it would kind of been, you know, I, it, it looked to me at least like it was kind of just an instinctual thing because he had lost attention for a brief second and he was looking at the ref. He kind of just, you know, his body lost sort of instinctual hold of Miocic for a second and Miocic was able to unravel his his grip. The way it looked to me is that it looked like Cormier stopped striking in order to drag the fight out more. That's what it looked like to me at least. It did live, for sure. That's what it looked for me, but watching it again, it's it's tough to judge whether whether or not it was Herb Dean's little bit of um speaking that kind of distracted Cormier for a second, and then that's what allowed the following sort of, you know, scramble to take place. Yeah. It's tough to tell. But regardless, very, very good round for uh, Cormier. And then we go into round two, and it's kind of, it's more of the same. I mean, less wrestling, admittedly, if any. I think he it maybe was, shoots it was for boxing. one or two, but he doesn't get them. He, he shot for a single leg at one point, but went over with the overhand. He shot the single leg to get Stipe in, like, take down defense mode. And You're right, he faked, the yeah, he faked the, uh, the single leg, he did. Very good fake as well. I'm surprised I can remember that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, overall, uh, I think it was just all box, and Daniel Cormier was using really good jab straights, which, again, Stipe is crazy, because Stipe is, like, the master of the jab straight. Yeah. Throughout the whole fight, Cormier did exactly what he did in their first fight, which was land the one-two, as you say. It was it was masterful the way, because he's such a shorter fighter, you would expect landing a one-two would be really difficult. You'd think he would have to kind of hook his punches in and kind of go yeah. under and, and uppercut more and, you know, overhand more. You'd think he would be an inside fighter, especially exactly. with how good his wrestling is. Exactly, yeah, but no, he's got this uncanny ability to read range against a fighter and proceed to punish you as soon as you step into range. Not it, not just that, but he actually reaches out with his, I believe it's his right hand, he reaches out with his right hand and covers his opponent's jabbing hand. He does that quite a lot. He does. He also um, grabs both of your hands and, and kind of forces you into a, a kind of a finger touching competition where you kind of, he meets both your hands all the time kind of thing. He was doing it to Miocic constantly. It was really good the way he would do it. He would force Miocic to kind of put his hands out to stop Cormier's, you know, hands pushing towards him. And then he would grab a hold of either the hands or the wrists or whatever else of Miocic and pull him in a little to then get the range for the one and the two. Very, very, very good technique. I think it's something he's probably learnt over the years. Because almost every person he fights is quite a considerable amount taller than him. So he has he's always had to figure out a way of measuring the reach uh, efficiently. Because other, otherwise it's, it's a, a tall task for a guy that short but that heavy fighting guys that are so much taller than him to, uh, you know, to, to kind of get in there and, and figure out exactly where he can hit them without getting hit himself. One thing that should be noted is that that technique of Cormier reaching out to grab the hands, that's actually something that John Jones does a lot. He, John Jones likes to grab both hands and then chop in leg kicks. He really he likes does. to do that. He does. And thinking about that, he also uses it to draw you into his elbows. Yeah, he, will he sets grab up elbows you. With Yeah, he will grab you with the wrists and then pull you in, let go of the one wrist and smack the elbow in as he's pulling you towards it. Yeah, he like elbows over the top of the guard quite a lot. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing he does. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, looking at the way Cormier has fought, Particularly Miocic in the, in in the two fights they've had, he's learnt quite a bit from the way Jones fights. He has, in particular, the hand fighting and also the uh, 
kind of the the ground control I think he has somewhat learned from from Jones in some aspects. Also leg kicks from Cormier in the first round, remember? Oh god, we uh, should we should touch on those leg kicks. They were heavy. He kind of the first sort of two minutes of that round were were largely leg kicks from Cormier. Or at least maybe the first minute. It was certainly a, uh, the opening of that of that fight. It was just leg kick, leg kick, leg kick from Cormier. Which again is a very Jones thing to do. It is. It is. Yeah, good call. Very good. Very good two rounds though. Then we move into round three and uh, Miocic is kind of getting a little bit more success in this round. It's still not, it's not fight changing, but he's getting, he's hitting Cormier more. And yeah. Cormier kind of, in this round more than any other, he was doing it in round one and definitely he was doing it in round two, but not so much. Round three was when he started to really, even as a huge Cormier fan as I am, irritate me for, for doing so, which is he began to drop his hands and he began to almost disrespect the power coming from Miocic. And uh, he actually said in the post-fight press conference that when he was being hit by Miocic, he didn't feel anything. He felt that the punches weren't doing any damage. They weren't, you know, hitting him in any way that was going to end the fight. And so he felt he was able to just walk through them. And I saw that during the fight. And if you remember when we were watching it live, I, I remember almost screaming two or three times throughout the fight, Cormier, please, you've proved your point. Now put your hands up. It's just, in, in, a, it, in a division like the heavyweight division, as chaotic as it is, and how you can stop a fight with one punch, no matter who you are in that division, it's never the, the best of ideas to just go into a fight with your chin up and your hands down. Doesn't matter who you are, how good your chin is. Heavyweights are heavyweights. Am I right? Especially against an opponent like Stipe, who he is such a technical boxer. He will throw things at 30%, 40% just to eventually line up that big shot that will put you down. And we've seen time and time again, Stipe has knockout power. Yeah, he does. We have also seen time and time again that he makes adjustments mid-fight. He did it in the Ngannou fight. In uh, in the first round against Francis Ngannou, he tried to keep it standing quite a bit. And he paid the price that everybody pays when you stand with Ngannou. He got hit. He got hit quite hard and quite a lot. And, uh, and he got rocked once or twice. So he took it to the ground. And once he realized, oh, okay... Ground game is where I, is where I can shine here. That was the rest of the fight. He made the adjustment there and that then and there, and uh, yeah, every round from then on, first thing he did, take Ungano down. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any other examples. A bit poor on that part, but for sure he has uh, made other adjustments. But in this fight, was when he made the best adjustment, in my opinion. The adjustment yeah, that was he, needed, because going into round four, he was struggling. I mean, it was tough for for Miocic those first three rounds. He was he was getting lit up. Cormier was definitely winning. He definitely won all three of those rounds. Round three was a little bit, a little bit more Miocic uh, heavy, shall we say? But by and large, Cormier still won the round. In, in my opinion, round one was potentially a 10-8. It could have been, yeah. With the slam, the ground control, I think it was like three and a half minutes or something that he ended up getting the, in that first round. And remember, there was almost a TKO. That was certainly something the judges would factor in. Exactly, exactly. But then in round four, everything changed. Almost immediately, everything changed. Because Miocic made... Uh, one simple adjustment, which was body hunt. And it was it was masterful the way he did it. He didn't even have to, like, 
set it up really not not in any sort of huge you know comboistic kind of way he would just fake the jab uh, or fake the straight actually he would I think and then come over with the with the front hand and kind of uh, I don't it's kind of half a hook half a uppercut kind of a shovel, shovel hook. hook yeah it's kind of a shovel hook he would kind of shovel hook the um the gut of Cormier and he did it over and over in that fourth round and uh, the first maybe I don't know five six times he did it didn't really seem to affect Cormier it kind of just brushed him up you know brushed off him like it was nothing but then he hits him with the seventh and then the eighth and then the ninth and Cormier begins to wince when he gets hit with these punches and then it was in the same spot every time it was it was it was beautiful, as I say. And then out of nowhere, well, not out of nowhere, shall we say, but um, at the perfect time, he uh, he just lands it in that in that sweet, sweet, sweet liver place, and Cormier winces so so bad. Right as soon as he gets hit, he curls over, winces. Miocic smells the blood and immediately just pours strikes onto Cormier's head doesn't even go anywhere else, doesn't try to punch the body again, nothing like that, doesn't try to throw a knee, nope, he just throws beautiful straights right into Cormier's head and TKOs him, there, then and there, after and getting you, beat up. <laughs> do you remember what I said live during that fight? The moment the fourth round happened and he started aiming for the, the body, you were saying, oh, it's too late to go to the body now, Steve, but you should have done that earlier to gas him out. Yeah. My first reaction, he's going for the lever. I can see it. It was, going yeah. For it was. It's exactly what you said. You did. You called it. And then I remember I said to you, that's true, but the the chances of catching the liver are quite, sl are quite slim, and if maybe if he'd have hunted from round one or round two, he would have stood a much better chance of it. And then, yeah, it happened. <laughs> thing is, it only takes one shot to the liver, and that's huge. It's, it's done. Exactly. Especially at heavyweight. He proved it. Yeah, he proved it. It One shot. And it was what I was saying earlier, right? I was mentioning that in heavyweight, it it's it's always that gamble. You, It's the one shot. It, ev almost every single heavyweight fight that ends, ends in that way. It ends with one huge shot that just lands perfectly, and that's it. End of the fight. Because it, it's the heavyweight division. They throw so hard, and they hit so freaking hard. You uh, you got to keep your wits about you. And if you don't, you pay the price. And, yeah, I mean, I saw it coming, to be honest. The way Cormier was fighting in that third and fourth round, it was beggar's belief. To be honest, that a guy with such a prestigious background in the sport and such a, you know, such a uh, experienced guy would go into a fight with another hugely experienced and really hard hitting opponent and keep his chin up and his hands down. I mean, regardless of what you feel, regardless of whether the guy is hitting you hard or not, you should keep your hands up. It's the heavyweight yeah. division. You never know. A lot of the time, those people will be punching at like half power because they're wanting to line up the big shot properly. So even if you are getting hit light, don't think that's all for power. They could just be gauging distance or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, uh, fighters make their mistakes, right? And I don't know. I... I I don't think you can take much away from the performance of Cormier as a whole in that fight. I think he once again proved himself as one of the best, by far. I mean, he took it to Miocic for three rounds straight. And Miocic hit him with everything but the kitchen sink. Cormier didn't even wince, didn't even blink. It It, it did nothing to him. And it was only when he started hunting for the liver that things even changed so 
you have to give it to Cormier. Regardless of the loss, you have to give it to him. He is still one of the best. And he is, yeah, hands down, in my books, one of the greatest of all time. And uh, one of my favorite fighters as well, still. Especially after that performance. I certainly don't think he can walk away disappointed, you know? I definitely do see retirement on the horizon now for him. Because, I mean, he's achieved everything he possibly can in the sport. And after losing the only thing that was really still holding him to the sport, it makes sense he would just retire now. I agree. I, uh... I mean, we'll wait to see. Nothing's been announced yet. He's uh, he said he's got to go back, speak to his family, speak to his friends. You know, take a take a week off or whatever, and look at it with a with a fresh, fresh pair of eyes kind of thing. And it's the best way to do it, I think, is to just take a little bit of time off and reassess everything, and then go from there. So I, I, I guess probably by next weekend we'll probably know what's going to happen but uh i wouldn't i wouldn't put it past him either way and i certainly would not blame him either way if he hangs up the gloves tomorrow i am more than happy i'm you know the guy's made me super super proud with everything he's done he's just a monumental fighter and now he's going to go forth and do so many things with the ufc from commentating to this new show that he's got every week where he breaks down fighters to uh the mind of daniel cormier yeah exactly the mind of daniel cormier to all this other stuff i mean yeah and i've seen him on a lot of youtube channels recently as well doing yeah, a... he, was, he was on um because science when he did the mortal combat video Yes, yes, exactly. He was on that, and he's been on a few other different stuff. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but he's been on a few different things. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot, yeah. a lot of of um, things in the Avenues. pipeline for Cormier. The thing is, he's already made his, his uh, legacy in the sport of mixed martial arts. He is already one of the most well-respected heavyweights and light heavyweights in the world. He doesn't exactly. need anything more in terms of fighting. And better yet, he's got the, the job coaching wrestling at AKA. He can just coach for the rest of his life if he wants to. And then he's got all the, the partnerships he has with the UFC where he's doing so many shows for them. He's already a big name, so he's, he's, he can get invited to do other things outside of the sport. He has so many options available to him. Yeah, exactly. So many so many avenues of uh, of of earning revenue for him that uh that yeah he's completely fine so as as we say I, I would not blame him at all if he uh turn around or turned sorry around and retired yep nearly 41 years of age i think that's time yeah but if he has one more fight at the same time i also wouldn't blame him you know because the money right now for him is so freaking good and uh yeah i believe but, it was but, 500 thousand for his last fight there exactly but yeah i mean I, either way either way he's good i i i think he's had a a very very storied career and as you say he can parlay it into so many avenues it's just it's kind of a, not pointless venture, but it's it's somewhat of a meaningless uh, avenue to take, you know, having more fights. It's yeah, kind of, nothing more to achieve now. Yeah, it, it doesn't add anything more to his legacy. If he, if he has another win, the only thing that would add to his legacy would be defeating John Jones. That's the yeah. only thing. That would add but John to his Jones is refusing to go to heavyweight, and Cormier will never go back to 205. He hates it there. Exactly. He's so... in love with the Popeye's chicken. He can't help it. <laughs> exactly. So, don't forget the cake as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, unless they can come to a 
compromise slash conclusion on the third Jones fight, I don't think we'll ever see Cormier again. I don't. And I don't blame him. I kind of don't want to see him again. I think he's done everything he could ever want to achieve. But yeah. Uh, I guess we'll quickly run down the rest of the card. Uh, I think we'll skip the early prelims. Uh, let me quickly pull up the card. Well, uh, so eight on we the, the had, card. Yeah, so in the prelims, we had Bermudez and Kenny. Uh, Kenny took the three-round decision win on Bermudez. It was a decent performance from Kenny, I think. Um, nothing too sort of, you know, outlandish to talk about, really. Just a pretty dominant kind of win. I think a fair amount of it took place on the ground, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was a very strange, like, grappling match. Yeah. Some unusual positions, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but nothing... Nothing uh, nothing on the level of the last three fights, shall we say. <laughs> then uh, we got on to Close versus Giagos, which was, again, three-round decision. Nothing particularly amazing happened. We had Sandhagen versus a Sun Sao after that. It was a that was pretty good performance like a... from Sandhagen, but it was again round three decision. I mean, um, yeah. I think you're misremembering the close fight. Remember, close was like Giagos versus close was a war. Remember, they were constantly trading strikes. You know, what yes, I remember? it was a bit of a war we, actually. We were talking about how Drakkar close normally takes things to a decision. And um, one of the, the people in the in the chat was saying, oh, I guess he's trying to prove me wrong. It, it was a war. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So that was a good fight. My mistake, guys. My mistake, Giago and Klaus. You guys did put on a good performance. So uh, I was even mentioning I thought they hated each other. <laughs> God, yeah, I remember it. <laughs> so then we had Sandhagen and Sun Tzu, Another round three decision. It was... That it's one right. was kind of grinded out. Yeah, it, it was a decent performance from Sandhagen, but nothing uh, to write actually, home about, really. I, I expect great things from Sandhagen, to be honest. I think I think we'll see him improve in the future, for sure. Yeah. His boxing was fantastic, and even on the ground with a Sun Tzu, and a Sun Tzu is a dangerous, dangerous man, even on the ground he feared his own. His defense was fantastic. Yeah. Definitely. We move on to... Karma worthy Devante Smith. Now that, was that crazy. Oh, that was a hell of a performance. It looked like either one could have been finished anywhere, really. <laughs> yeah, I agree. But yeah, it's a... the finish from Worthy, I mean, just wow. <laughs> that was a that was a hell of a performance. You can see why it got a performance of the night bonus along with. Uh, Miocic, I think. Which fight was it where um, one of them kept on throwing leg kicks? And I actually said beforehand, he's going to get caught over the top when he throws the leg kick. That I was said the Worthy that. Smith. That was the Worthy Smith fight. I, I thought so. <laughs> yeah, that was Devante Smith throwing the leg kicks. And then he threw another one and Worthy uh, got him with an overhand, I think. Yeah, he just went straight over the top. It was it was good, <laughs> good fight definitely, and a very good finish. Yeah. I was getting flashbacks from like uh, Jones versus Machida when Machida was coming over the top of Jones' leg kicks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, except a more that. successful version. Well, I mean, Machida was finding success in the first round in that fight. True, um, true, true. I, yeah, I was thinking more the the outcome of <laughs> of the Jones Machida fight. Yeah. Jones adapted by uh, throwing the elbow immediately after the leg kick, so Machida would run into the elbow. Yeah, he did. Didn't he uh, sleep Machida in that fight? Yeah, guillotine choke up against the yep, cage. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. It's not. Let's not remind the folks about about that one. So yeah, we it. had Derek Brunson versus Ian Heinish. After that, that was um, a war. It was. It was, and Brunson has 
very, very much improved over his last couple of performances, I think. Especially in cardio. Yeah. 100%. His cardio has improved, his boxing has improved, well, his striking as a whole has improved. His, uh... Uh, did we see too much of the ground in that fight? I don't think we did. We saw a little bit. Remember, Derek Brunson picked up Heinish and slammed him. True, we had true. Two I card. do remember now. Yeah, I knew there was something that was leading me to say his wrestling was, had improved. Yeah, so his wrestling has definitely improved as well. I mean, yeah. Well done, Brunson. He's definitely made adjustments and uh, and for the for the better. After that, we had the Yusuf Benitez fight, which was, again, an incredible finish. I mean, Yusuf's going to be a contender. Am I am I wrong in that, do you reckon? Or Only fight on the card I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, uh, the KO TKO round one. I think it was a KO. That doesn't help me. If you, if you told me the strike that you landed... I, I would think know. it was a straight. I'm not too sure though. Uh, I can't find it in my mind. Shall I quickly pull up the clip? It makes sense if I remember so many other details about other fights. It makes sense that, that it would fall apart somewhere. <laughs> That's true. Well, I can add my input at least. Yeah. So Yusuf was incredible in that fight. It was a it was a first round uh, TKO. Oh, so it was a TKO, not a KO. Oh, I see. Let's uh, see if I can get this up. Okay, so it was uh, Benitez that had landed a counter punch, and it stunned Yusuf, sent him to the ground. But that kind of seemed to wake Yusuf up, and uh, less than a minute later, he plowed forward. Um, oh, sorry, Benitez plowed forward. And that uh, Yusuf landed a devastating right, straight right, mm. and knocked the dude straight down. And then he uh, proceeded to follow up with hammer fists before uh, before the ref called it. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I can't remember. Uh, must have had a lapse of focus during that fight. <laughs> well, there was there was uh, some very big fights to come, so I don't blame you. But yeah, it's uh. Very, very, very good performance from Yusuf, and I definitely see him moving up the rankings and uh, becoming a contender in the next couple of years, for sure. So I think we can move on to uh, the next card and our predictions for the card. Um, I've had a quick look. I literally don't recognize a single person on that card apart from the main event. It's all names that I just do not recognize. Or if I do recognize them, I don't know enough about them to voice any kind of opinion. So, it's just the main event for me in terms of picks. Uh, we have Andrade versus uh, Weilei Zhang. Jessica Andrade. Or Andrade. Sorry. Is it Andrade or Andrade? Uh, I'll just say Andrade. Andrade. Yeah. That's it. I was wrong with both. Silly me. <laughs> but uh yeah, Wele Zhang and Andraj, I I don't know. I think I think it would be kind of foolish of anyone to not pick Jessica Andraj in this uh, in this uh, fight. I've got I've got Wei Wei Zhang by flying on the plot. What are you talking about? <laughs> it could happen. I mean you 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 can never say never, right? But I do think judging on the track record of the ladies and how they fight I think it's going to remain standing for the majority of it. And uh, I think Jessica's going to gonna put the beating on Wele. Maybe a round two TKO. Yeah, I'm going to say round two TKO. 
yeah, uh, I I do not see Weili Zhang winning this fight at all. She's made some fantastic improvements in the last few fights, but she's had going yeah. from Jessica Aguilar to Tisha Torres, there was a huge difference. And I mean, she submitted Aguilar in the first round. That's that's no small task. She's hard to submit. Very true. Very true. I mean, um, even Claudia Gadelia couldn't submit her. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it is true. I don't know. I think, um, yeah, if you could pick a round, what round would you pick? I'm going to say a second. Uh, it would take a while for Jessica and Drage to figure out the best way to close the distance because she has the shorter fighter. But when she's closed that distance, she hits damn hard. Hell yeah, she does. I'm I'm still upset about that Kovalkiewicz loss. <laughs> What about um, the performance that she had against uh, Rose? I wasn't impressed by that performance because while her wrestling was definitely better than Rose, well, Rose was, yeah, <laughs> with the jab, Rose could keep her at distance. She was very, very good with that jab and the footwork. So, very true. Yeah. I don't feel like that's a very good testament to Andrade's skill. As much as it is our title win and our, our previous win, I don't yeah. feel like it's a good way to show our skills. I'd say the Kovalkiewicz fight is more impressive in terms of striking. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, I would agree with that. That's true. She definitely put on a performance in that Kovalkiewicz fight. See, the thing about Andrade is that if you walk forward and meet her in the centre of the octagon, she will knock you out. She hits way too hard. But if you're constantly backing up and keeping her at distance with the jab, she struggles to close that distance because she is the shorter fighter. She's got tiny, tiny little legs. She can't move very fast. Yeah. It's easy to keep her at a distance if you know what you're doing. Yeah, agreed. Until you get backed up against the cage, in which case she will grab your leg and throw you around. <laughs> yeah, you can say that again. <laughs> so, on to, uh, on to a little bit of MMA news, shall we say? Or, more specifically, uh, a person in MMA, shall we say? Uh, quite a lot of stuff has come out today. Uh, in one way, shape, or form. Some of it fairly big, some of it not so big. I guess we'll start off with the big and then move to the less. Um, so, the Irish boxing champion, Luke Keeler, has, uh, has come out and said that he's had a phone call with Conor McGregor over the weekend, where he, uh, to mince words, called him a coward for uh, the punching of the old man in the pub and uh, it let you know one thing led to another exchange of words happened and long story short Conor McGregor has verbally agreed to a boxing bout with Luke Keeler what are your thoughts on that sir all right um okay <laughs> I hadn't heard of this before. Um, well, Luke Keeler is a very good boxer. He, he may only be an Irish boxing champ, but he's like he's not super. But he is very, very. Uh, he's not much of a knockout artist, which yeah. is a very good thing if you're going up against McGregor. You don't want to be the kind of guy who'll burn yourself out. You want to be the kind of guy who'll drag out to a decision. And that's what Luke Keeler does. Um, so, yeah. I I think... McGregor's going to get run down. Not quite as bad as Mayweather did to him. But still pretty bad. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I'm inclined to agree with you. Um, I think... I think the boxing gloves make a big difference in terms of the power differential that Connor is able to deliver on people. 
I think not, we, not just power, but it makes a big difference defensively too because the gloves are so huge. You can just use them as a big shield. That is very true. Yeah, very true. And Connor throws a lot of looping hooks as well. And looping a punch doesn't really work too well in boxing. You kind of got to really loop it right round if you want to get yeah. anywhere with them. And even then, if the glove gets moved at all, the only the only place you're hitting is the back of the head. And then, you know, do that a couple of times and you're having a point deducted. So That's why when it comes to boxing, the best way to actually get around the guard is to get in really tight and throw just short angled punches. Yes. Uh, the, the way you see Povetkin throw them. Alexander Povetkin is a master of that. He will get in close and just find little gaps in the guard that he'll go around. Yeah, exactly. Or the alternative is to kind of do the uh, the Muhammad Ali approach where you kind of, you use your jab to uh, keep your opponent away from you. So that whenever they come forward, no matter what they're trying to do, you kind of keep that distance. And of course, Ali was, was famous for... Uh, holding people up against the ropes and doing his his uh his short strikes as well and and his rope dope as well he was happy to be up against the ropes one of the few fighters actually who uh who looked very comfortable up against ropes and was more than happy to just allow you to uh waste your breath trying to damage him and then he would kind of pounce on you as soon as uh as soon as he smelt that you were slowing down at all the thing is, too, well, Ali had fantastic head movement. So when he was up against the ropes, he would just swing his head around and make you mess everything. Yeah, yeah, the patented rope dope. Yeah, exactly. He, uh, he was an expert at it. Yeah. And, and Or you could take it more modern times and you could talk about Mayweather's style, where he uh, uh, relies a lot more a on, too. on... He's too prone to hugging. Yeah, he does. He does hug a lot, but he he's very good at making you gas out, trying to knock him out. Because he shoulder rolls everything. That's his style. Less about head movement, more about shoulder rolls. Yeah. Definitely. Still a, still a very good style though. I mean, styles make fights, after all, especially in boxing. So, uh. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see what, what comes of this. I mean, it's only a verbal agreement at the moment, and we've heard nothing from McGregor's end. Not yet, at least. John Kavanaugh will just be like, yeah, just don't do it, McGregor. Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I would advise him to avoid it. Yeah. Um, I guess we can talk about what else. I mean, God, the list just goes on and on. <laughs> I'll uh I'll cover the main stuff though. Uh video has surfaced of uh a pub owner or at, at least one pub I think there might be multiple people have done this now, but it started off at least with one Irish pub owner in Florida who filmed himself pouring uh Connor's Irish whiskey down the toilet and flushing it. And saying how the guy's a disgrace and, uh, yeah, doesn't ever want to watch him fight again, etc., etc. So publicity is getting pretty bad for Connor as of late, especially with this old man punching business. Um, just to quickly gloss over it for any, anyone that hasn't heard, um, video surfaced about a week ago of, uh, yeah, more video, I know, <laughs> of uh, Connor. Punching an old man in a pub in Ireland uh, after offering the man a glass of whiskey, of uh, his proper 12 whiskey, and the man Correction, a glass declined. of poison. <laughs> yes, a glass of poison called proper 12. And uh, the man declined the uh, the shot or whatever it was. As a Connor kind of, you know, offered it maybe once or twice more, I think it was. The guy just kept declining and um, Connor just, just pop shot at him. Out of nowhere. That old man ate that shot. He did, yeah, he did. But uh, but what do you think about about people um, flushing proper twelve down the toilet in protest? Um, I, I feel like the vats are going to get sick. 
<laughs> so I'm a little worried for the health and safety of the, the local wildlife. But overall, while I would much rather that human feces be flushed down the toilet, it's probably better for the environment. I will say I am glad that people are disposing of it appropriately. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. <laughs> that's, that's Rat's opinion, and I, I don't—I don't think I need to add anything to that. I, I think um, I think that was probably said said just about perfectly. The, the, the sir, Rat's opinion. We're poisoning my people. <laughs> On to the next bit, still on Conor McGregor, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, uh, it's not over yet, we'll be soon, don't worry, we're not going to talk about him forever, but, uh, God, yeah, his, his just a little bit more. Off like a catwalk. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I, I just wanted to get your opinion on this, because I, I don't know whether it's, it's truth or not, or whether it's just for sake of, you know, pressing charges and stuff, but either way... It's definitely not good. Uh, it's turned out that the victim of the assault from Conor McGregor, the guy that got punched in the pub, he's uh, not been able to leave his house for a week straight because of the oh. injuries suffered from the punch. Oh, apparently, he's learned from Rose Namajunas. <laughs> uh, apparently, it. Uh, I don't know it, whether it's emotional scarring or or more physical stuff but either way he's uh he's stated to the press that he felt he couldn't leave his house for a whole week due to due to uh being hit by mcgregor uh, to be fair he does stay in dublin which is well conor mcgregor's home turf he might be worried that people who are like friends and associated with conor mcgregor may attack him and that is a reasonable worry conor mcgregor is as a thug you know yeah I, I agree with you there. Uh, there's definitely a case to be made for retaliation and and what else. Even though, I mean, you know, there's nothing to retaliate on. The guy didn't do anything. But some people are some people and they don't necessarily see that the same way as the rest of us. And yeah, who knows, right? Who knows what could happen? Yeah. And... Uh, Conor McGregor is surrounded by a whole bunch of yes men. We've established this. How do you think he got a gang of 20 together to attack a bus? It's a whole bunch of people that agree with him. Exactly. Exactly. Well, who knows? Maybe maybe he was told uh, by the Nagueras to go and capture the bus for them. <laughs> Little uh, Chell Sonnen reference there for those of you that are fans. So, moving on from Connor, because I think it's about time. <laughs> yes, yeah, he doesn't deserve the attention. Yeah, he takes up a lot of people's attention these days. Um, I guess we could move on to uh, to gaming, really. I mean, I think I think we've covered just about uh, as much of the MMA news as there is for the last uh, last few days slash week. Video gaming, though. In that, in that aspect, there's a lot to talk about. Um, in particular, microtransactions. Uh, I certainly, <laughs> I know my own thoughts on, uh, on, on microtransactions. Um, in particular, the kind of, the ones that we're seeing in AAA games. Not so much your free-to-play games, where they, you know, kind of rely more on the microtransactions for server updates and keeping things running and whatever else but when we see them in the likes of ea games and um you know take like ufc for instance or battlefield or you know uh, if we take activision you've got call of duty you take ubisoft you've got like assassin's creed and the list just goes on and on all these games that are charging 60 pounds minimum for the absolute base model of that game if you want to get a special edition of any kind it's going to cost you 90 quid or 100 quid or even more and yet they still load it with all of these tiny little mini transactions where they want you to pay for a booster here and a and a pack there and a a little bit else i just 
it's corporate greed at its absolute filthiest, in my opinion. And and the worst part is the presentation of microtransactions is designed in such a way that it's meant to cause you to become addicted. Like for example, the the animation that we use for the Apex Legends look great. It's all very bombastic and extremely Oh uh, god, yes. It's extremely exciting to look at. So that's clearly a very intentional move to try and spur that addiction in people. It is. It is all designed around the same philosophy that you see in casinos, which is bright lights, flashing colors, lots of big oomphs and ahs and whoa, you gotta win! And yeah, it, it entices you to want to play more, want to spend more, want to open one more pack. It's all, uh, it's all psychology based. I mean, you look at if the, one of the greatest examples is to look at the evolution of pack openings of FIFA games. Because they get released every year, right? If you go back to the very first FIFA game that had Ultimate Team, I think it was FIFA 12, maybe FIFA 13. Those pack, so pack openings, super simple. You just, you literally saw a rip open on the top of the pack. Out comes the cards. They flip. And that's it. You, you find out what you got. Nothing more to it. You progress through the years and it gets flashier and flashier and flashier till now in in what i think fifa 19 we're on if you look up the the um animation for opening a pack for that game it is wildly i mean you're talking splashes and and confetti's coming out and loads of loud obnoxious music is playing and and it's big and bombastic and it's it's all a huge little event to open up these packs and it's it's just all entirely enticed to get you to open the next one just like you say i hate you <laughs> i really do i mean ea are kind of the worst at it but they're not, by all means they're not the only ones i mean if we look at the the recent apex legends controversy that's come out with um yes. with a this 170 pound axe yes the axe that's it i was about to say it was a hammer but no the axe yes it just i don't even know what to say about that i, I it's it's obnoxious is what it is see i would not have a problem with it if they explicitly stated the um, the odds of you winning that particular item, but they don't. They keep it secret. They make you think that it's a higher chance of you winning than you than there actually is. Even if the odds were released, I I don't have any um what you call it. I don't have any excuses to give them for putting microtransactions yeah. into these games that already cost hundreds and hundreds of pounds for any decent amount of content. And then you, you want to charge us. I mean, they not only charge us special editions of the game, pre-order editions of the game and whatever else, but they then have you buy a season pass. They then have you buy packs and like little, you know, um cosmetic stuff and whatnot and then on top of that you also have these microtransactions for booster packs for xp and assassin's creed so you can level up a bit quicker and if you don't buy these packs to upgrade your leveling up it takes forever to level up the grind is completely obnoxious it takes hours upon hours to get anywhere you're grinding out the same fortress over and over again killing the same enemies a million times over just to get up two or three levels so you can access this mission because this mission over here you really want to do because that's how you progress the story but it's locked behind a certain level and to get to that level you can only grind because you've yeah. you've finished everything else that's on the map and the game moves so slow in terms of its xp bar that without that little five pound purchase of the double xp boost you're stuck just grinding out for hour upon hour and it's obnoxious. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is especially bad for that. Yeah. I, I am playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey at the moment because of the fact that I love the setting. I love the ancient Greek setting. I love the, the culture of ancient Greece. I love the, the whole Greek pantheon. I love yeah. the lore. But the way, the, the rate at which you gain money and XP is seriously putting me off. 
the next story mission for me is level 15, I believe. I'm not that far in. I'm only level 12, and that XP bar is moving at a snail's pace. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And it's only going to get slower. I mean, you have first-hand experience. I haven't played uh, the latest one, but I did play the one before because I'm a big lover of ancient Egypt. I uh, I went on a holiday to Egypt a few years ago myself, actually. So I, um, I've always been a big lover of the pyramids and whatever else. So getting the opportunity to revisit those pyramids in in a game was, you know, I couldn't pass up that opportunity, no matter what the, the reviews Especially were. Especially claiming all of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So no matter what the reviews were, no matter what microtransactions were in or not in the game, I had to purchase it on that basis. But my god, even that game was grindy as all hell. And it's got, you know, there's so much to do over the map, but it's all the same thing. It's the same exact objective, copied and pasted a thousand, excuse me guys, a thousand times over, all across the map. And you just gotta grind it out over and over and over again before you can get anywhere and all the missions that you really want to do are locked behind a particular level or a particular mission that you got to do beforehand or you need this particular weapon in order to access this mission or whatever else and it's just it's artificial game lengthening at its absolute worst and it shouldn't be there you know if you can't make your game eight hours long with just plain ass story content, then maybe you should, you know, take another six months to create your game and put a little bit more content in it and maybe not try to rush it out on a year on year basis. Or even a, even the... a two year basis that they're at at the moment with, the, with Assassin's Creed, I think. Even then, it's like, why are you trying to put a time limit on these games? Why not just release them when they're ready? I think one of the forms of microtransactions I hate the most is the one we previously touched on, which is Ultimate Team. I hate that the most because it is you competing against other people. Therefore, if other people are getting, uh, like, if other people are, well, spoiled brats sitting there with daddy's credit card, <laughs> they, they can get themselves at such an advantage that you almost feel forced to do the microtransactions because otherwise you're not going to get anywhere if you want to be competitive. Exactly. And not only that, but if you remember, well, I, I, I'm assuming you probably know this anyway, there are, uh, a patent got released not too long ago. Uh, it surfaced from Activision and it was a, a patent that showed a system where if you were in a lobby with somebody, no, say you would purchased a certain item, right? You would then be put into lobbies with people that didn't have that item so that then when people got killed by you, they, they would watch the, the kill cam. And... Yeah, they would watch the kill cam. You know where this is going. They would see the gun and they would think, oh my God, that gun is so OP. I need that gun. They would then go and purchase it. And then in turn, those people would start getting matched up with others who didn't have the gun. And would then be killed, and then want to purchase, and so and so on. The cycle goes. Now, yeah. as far as we know, it's only Activision that uses this right now. But that's as far as we know. We don't. Nobody knows whether EA uses the same pattern. And 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 when you when you play FIFA, for instance, the game tries to match you up with people that have Lionel Messi in their team, so that you keep. You keep losing and you keep thinking to yourself, Jesus Christ, when can I get my messy card? And so you go on to Ultimate Team and you, well, you're already in Ultimate Team. But yeah, you go on to the store, you put some money in, get your FIFA points or whatever they're called. And then you keep moving and keep, you know, keep opening packs, trying to get that Messi or Ronaldo or, or wh whoever else it is that you're after. And it's it's all designed around making as much money as possible while giving the gamer or the, the player as little enjoyment as possible and as little a reward and as, as, as lack of fulfillment as possible for all the effort that they put into the game, which is never how it used to be, right? And another game that used microtransactions. It's not the same loot crate system that, that we, were, we were talking about previously, but just general microtransactions. 
is Bethesda with Fallout 76. Mm. And they're trying to do the same thing with Wolfenstein Youngblood, if you remember correctly. If you go onto the Wolfenstein Youngblood uh, Steam page, which I will do right now just so I have my facts straight. Yeah. They, they've listed that there will be micro-purchases for like XP boosts and, and skins for oh. guns and such. Oh, Lord. So even Bethesda's fallen down the rabbit hole here. And that's off the back of the first Wolfenstein remake that came out 2013 or 14, somewhere, somewhere around there. And it was a smash hit. Yeah. Everybody loved it. Godly. And now we're now two games later and it's it's getting review bombed. It's just Yep, I'm lo I'm looking at Wolfenstein Youngblood right now. First thing I see is buy gold bars. <laughs> Give me that Nazi gold. Oh jeez. It's just it's not if I mean look at look at what a how much of a shambles Fallout seventy six has continuously been and still is. I mean, that game just Gets released. Absolute buggy mess. Nothing to do. It takes them a year to even put AI into the game. Meanwhile, microtransactions surfaced in the game within a matter of a month. <laughs> it's just like, what are these companies doing now nowadays? And uh, Take-Two Interactive is exactly the same as well. You look at um, Red Dead. NBA. Red Dead. Everybody was waiting, you know, biting their nails in anticipation for Red Dead Online. Thinking it was going awful, to be the, the next biggest and baddest thing after GTA 5. What do we get? A bare bones multiplayer with nothing to do but a crap ton of stuff to buy with your real money. It's. Yeah. I. I don't know. And, it's just and all the things with the in game currency, the actual dollars currency, far too expensive. Way yeah. too expensive. I'm not spending four hundred dollars on a jacket. Go away. Exactly. It's it's ridiculous. You're right. Not to mention Grand Theft Auto V's gone exactly the same way. Hundreds and hundreds of pounds, if not thousands of pounds, or dollars should I say, just to get yourself one jacket or one shirt. It's Yeah, there, there, it's ridiculous. There's, there's a um a neon suit you can get that's one hundred uh, thousand. <laughs> Insane. <laughs> Oh my god. I ain't, I ain't paying that. It's just beggar's belief. It really is. M and Most I paid for a clothing item on GTA 5, well, GTA Online, was, uh, I believe, 50 grand for like a, a jet fighter's fight, flight suit. But that's because I'm a pilot in every heist I do. That, <laughs> that fits me. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I mean, it just, just goes to show, doesn't it? It's just ridiculous. These companies are getting too greedy just too too greedy i mean have you heard about take two interactive uh sending private investigators to that youtuber's home and he uh closed his channel down and took a sabbatical off twitter and everything because a result i didn't see anything like that yeah he uh like, basically it. so basically I'll, I'll i'll give you the 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 short version of the story the guy the guy has a youtube channel he does a coverage of Borderlands 3 that's about to come out. He gets hold of a Twitch channel that's not supposed to have its broadcasts available, but accidentally did. And it was a testing channel for Borderlands 3. And he got hold of it. He had a look at the past broadcasts, got a hold of some gameplay from those past broadcasts, proceeded to pal compiled together a, a video uh, about it. He releases the video, Rockstar get a hold of it, they send suited Rockstar? and booted private investigators to his home who barge in and demand that he immediately ceases what he's doing in terms of releasing information about the game. And he also uh, relinquishes, like, you know, the way that he got the information and everything, you know, tells them how he did it, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, everybody's all up in arms and thinking like, what the hell is this? All this guy did is leak some information, right? I mean, it, it's journalism. That's all that is. You can't like, you can't send private investigators to a guy's home for that. But then yeah. a day or two goes by and 
it turns out that, and it's not, I don't think this is 100% confirmed yet, but there's a lot of sources re reporting it, so it appears like it may be true. It turns out that the guy was not only making a YouTube, or making multiple YouTube videos about the information, he was also offering more information on a private Discord server if you paid him $5 for access. Now that is different. That the, the It's one thing to report on something. It's another thing to charge somebody for information that shouldn't be out there. Yeah, that... Okay, uh, from a law perspective, uh, as I study law, that would be seen as a violation of copyright exactly. due to the fact that you're using copyrighted material for financial gain. Exactly, yeah. Journalism is fine. If you're just doing free journalism, you're not making any profit, it, it go ahead, report it. But if you're trying to make money from it, very different. And I think that's where the, the private investigators were, you know, were called upon. But either way, I, it's just such a bad look for a company to go sending investigators, suited and booted, privately to, to a guy's home and getting him yeah. to, to shut everything down. I mean, that's... There's, there was a much, much better de way to deal with this, and that was just send an email. Exactly. Literally just email him asking, hey, can you please stop disclosing this information? And also, can you please tell me where we got, where you got this information from so we can plug the hole? That's all they had to say. They didn't need to send investigators to the house. Exactly. I mean, it's the same thing as uh, back in 2014, 15, I think, when um, the PC version of GTA 5 first came out. And there was a guy making a, a mod called 5M. And it was like a uh, sort of a replacement for the standard GTA Online. And it was more sort of role play based and you could, you know, interact with people on a much more sort of realistic basis and the like. It was a really big mod, really kicking off lots of support behind it. They sent private investigators again to the guy's home again with a, a you know, cease and assist um, letter telling him to cease all operation immediately, as well as hand over all operation immediately. So all his servers, all of his like equipment, everything gone, taken there and then uh, on the basis that he was um, potentially taking away revenue from Rockstar. And he was potentially being a rival sort of like, you know, um, competitor to their online business even though he was not in any way shape or form going to ever ask anyone for a penny to make this mod they still sent private investigators cease and assist uh cease and assisted him they freaking or ceased and de desisted him should i say they uh took all of his equipment everything he, he owned that the, that he used to run like the mod and everything all gone just <laughs> Freaking yeah, corporate, he, he, like, backhanded fucking whatever you call it, 101. It, I don't even know what to say about it. It's so dirty and so, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see that as him stealing business at all. He's literally just making a community for the game. Like, who cares at that point? And actually, it could have benefited Rockstar in the long term. Because once people start hearing about roleplay servers on GTA Online, it may have attracted a lot of people who prefer roleplaying compared to having 13 year olds show up and down a microphone i i would happily play online more if there was more communities like that compared to the the usual toxic community that plays gta online exactly exactly but they just don't see it that way and i mean rockstar have always had a big issue with mod um creators and i think it's ever since the hot coffee incident i think ever since the PC release of San Andreas happened and modders got into the files and found that there was a half-baked sex minigame in the San Andreas and they released a YouTube video of it and they made a, they got it fixed, you know, they got it working and made a mod of it and everything and 
they, why do you think GTA 4 had such a terrible PC port? It was, yeah, it was like, no, exactly. It was, to, it was to get back at the PC players. Probably was. I mean, yeah, they really don't like PC players, that's for sure. So, maybe that's part of it at least, but yeah, I agree with you. I just think, you know, the guy was in no way, shape or form going to affect your revenue. If anything, he would actually improve it because he'd be attracting a completely different type of player. Exactly. I just, yeah, I don't know. It is what it is, as a, as a, as a famous Hawaiian kickboxer once said. It is what it is. Uh, I think, I think we are just about wrapped up for this week, at least. Or this episode, yeah, at least, should I say. Topics. I mean, who knows, there might be another episode this week if something big happens. Uh, you never know with the MMA community <laughs> and the news. We've got a lot of time over that. Yeah, yeah. With, yeah, we've definitely ran on quite a bit. Uh, I think I, I think the viewers are, oh my God, a lot, a lot to listen to for sure. <laughs> um, so with that being said, I think we will, yeah, we'll wrap it all up. Um, I guess we'll do a quick Q&A before we close it, actually. That, I think... Yeah, that'd be a good idea. I think. Well, first we'll remind you guys of the question we gave earlier, actually, which is of the welterweight division, right? So, uh, if you remember, Rat, what was it now? It was essentially, with the way that the welterweight division is shaping up, with Tyron Woodley losing to Camaro with Stephen Thompson, uh, who was a gatekeeper for such a long time, uh, getting knocked out by Anthony Pettis, and then Nate Diaz coming out and dominating Anthony Pettis. How does everyone see the welterweight division shaping up in the future? How does everyone think it's going to progress? Beautifully put. Better than I could ever put it. Thank you for that. And also, great reminder, because I had genuinely forgot. <laughs> I was looking through my notes, and I was just like, oh, I'll just get... It's the sewer at the set. It's quicker. <laughs> so, if you guys can email us the answer to that question with, along with your answer to the quiz question to the following address, that is lastpunchpodcast at mail.com. I'll repeat that again. That is lastpunchpodcast at mail.com. If you guys can email that along with the answer to the following quiz question, the winner, uh, the guy, with the person with the correct answer, or the people, should I say, because I imagine there'll be more than one, with the correct answer, we will put all your names into a little hat, draw one out, and the winner will get a, a little shout out where we get to, um, where we tell on air what their answer was for the welterweight question, and yeah, give them give them a little shout out on air. I'll uh, I'll do a little a little something. I'm sure Rat will. We'll give them a shout out of some kind as well. But yeah, so this week's quiz question is about Daniel Cormier, of all people. How many titles slash championship belts has Daniel Cormier won across his entire career? So that's for all uh, divisions, all um, organizations, you know, strike force, uh, UFC, light heavyweight, heavyweight, all of Not them. counting amateur wrestling. Yes, MMA not belts. only his professional career, though. Yes, but mixed martial arts belts, all encompassed from every organization he's ever featured in. How many has he won? If you guys can get that correct, you'll get a shout out as well as uh, a readout of your your prediction for the welterweight division. I think uh, I think we'll get some interesting answers about that because that welterweight division is shaken up right now with Masvidal, Diaz. Um, I'm trying to think, there was somebody else. Oh, Leon Edwards. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just it's getting crazy. That division's completely flipped on its head, and Robbie Lawler's taking the worst of it. <laughs> yeah, and Thompson as well. Actually, Thompson is dropping down the the rankings now. Now that he's lost and everybody else is winning, he's uh yeah. he's gonna get pushed down quite a bit. 
yeah, getting robbed by Till and then getting knocked out by Pettis, that's not a good way to go. Yeah. I mean, the, the Till loss didn't affect his ranking that much, I don't think, but the, the Pettis knockout, that will have affected it, for sure. He'll come back, though, and he will come back strong, I feel like. Yeah, Thompson is Thompson. I mean, he's called the Wonder Boy for a reason. He'll be back, 100%. 100%. Big shout out to uh to Wonderboy actually. If any of you guys don't know, he streams live on uh live on Twitch now and then under the uh alias Wonderboy MMA, I believe it is. So yeah. I'll quickly double check that because I've got the fold. By all means. But yeah, you guys check him out. Also his brother streams on uh on Twitch. Wonderboy Faith. Wonderboy Faith, that's it. Yeah. So if any of you guys didn't know, he streams up. Uh, quite a lot of MMA guys stream, actually. But Wonderboy's not got as big of a following as some of the others. So, yeah. Big shout out to him. I hope that... Uh... Bigger than my channel. <laughs> hey, bigger than mine as well. <laughs> I'm just saying. Anyway. Anyway, with, with that out of the way, uh, yeah. I, I think we can just about wrap things up. One more time, I'll remind you guys. It is lastpunchpodcast at mail.com. We want the answer to... Cormier's uh, championship amount, I guess. And then also what your guys' predictions are for the welterweight. So with that being said, um, yeah, I think I'm just about done. Rap, is there anything you want to say before we wrap it all up? Yeah, I'd say we're about finished up here. Oh, goody then. Alrighty. I'll, uh, I'll let you guys listen to the jingle one last time. And with that being said, we'll see you on episode two. But until then, Ta-ta. The Last Punch Podcast with the Queen and the Rat. Oh, yeah.